If you think about it, 10,000 is a rather odd number. Not literally odd, of course, but still strange. It is the first number without an identity of its own. Ever since we Europeans decided to convert our ten spindly manipulators into abstractions called numbers, the powers of ten have had pride of place in our counting system. Having absorbed that wonderful Indian invention, the zero, into our zeitgeist, we have granted each turn of the numerical odometer a name of its own. Ten. One hundred. One thousand. Until ten thousand. Why is this innocent quantity denied the honor of a unique name? If one followed by one zero could have a name, and one followed by two zeros, or three, why not four? Not for the sake of any rational pattern. There is still a glowing remnant of a debate, now just warm coals amid the ash, as to whether our current naming system, adopted by science worldwide, should have replaced the older system, which called a billion a thousand million and a trillion a billion. In short, there is no reason why 10,000 could not have a name of its own. And in many languages, it does. In Hebrew, it is called Ravava. In Mandarin, it is called Wan. Cantonese, Japanese, and Korean call it Man. Vietnamese, Van. And Khmer and Thai, Meun. Russian calls it Tma, though whether this is a cognate or coincidence, I do not know. But perhaps the most notable name for 10,000, from a Western perspective at least, is the ancient Greek Myrioi, or Myriad, from which English derives the word for uncountable. And in Greek, Mandarin, and many other languages, the word for 10,000 also means a vast, uncountable number. To this day, Wan Sui, literally 10,000 years, is a common wish for long life in China. But why 10,000? From our modern perspective, flooded as we are daily with quantities casually rising to billions and trillions, to throw up your hands at such a relatively tiny number seems somewhat parochial. What was it about this one number that so overawed many ancient civilizations? Well, for one thing, it is 100 squared, just as 100 is 10 squared. It may be coincidence, but there are a number of references to 10,000 squared in ancient sources. Chinese traditionally wished the emperor a reign of Wan Wan Sui, or 10,000 times 10,000 years. The largest number in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, refers to Tu Hippoku Dis Miriades Miriadon, or 200 million horses. And yet, there is, I think, a more intuitive reason for choosing such a number. 10,000 does seem to mark the limit of our everyday understanding. A tenth of a millimeter, or a ten thousandth of a meter, is about the width of a human hair, or a single pixel on an average-sized television screen. It is, in short, about as far as the human eye can comfortably discern without a magnifier. Conversely, 10,000 meters is about as far as you can see to the horizon from a height of about 9 meters, or 30 feet. The deepest ocean trenches are little more than 10,000 meters deep, while 10,000 meters up places us comfortably above the world's highest mountains. London, where I live, is about 10,000 meters in radius to its innermost ring road. There are no rivers or mountain ranges on Earth as long as 10,000 kilometers, at least not on land. Most continents are not that wide. A journey from Lisbon to the easternmost tip of the widest continent, Eurasia, would comprise about 15,000 kilometers. The Pacific Ocean, the largest thing on our planet, is somewhat less than 20,000 kilometers across at its widest. 20,000 kilometers is, in fact, almost exactly halfway around the world. This is no coincidence, because the kilometer was originally conceived as 1 10,000th the distance from the equator to the pole. It was to be the signature of the Age of Reason, a unit of pure geometry, divorced from the concerns of men, and thus of equal use to everyone. And it was not going to be a guess. Someone would have to go and measure it. The French Revolution of 1791 was more than just an overthrow of a monarchy. It was an attempt to shift the paradigm of human thought. No more would the world be governed by the arbitrary, whimsical, cobbled-together realities of old. A new, ordered reality would be constructed from the ruins, one based on reason and precision. To that end, the French Academy of Sciences ordered all the random, historically-laden forms of measurement be cast aside, and a new set of common measurements be implemented. 
based on a single decimal system. And they meant all of them. Not only were standards like distance and temperature to be decimally based, but circles would be divided into 100 degrees. Weeks were divided into 10 days, and days into 10 100 minute hours, with each minute lasting 100 seconds. Most of these changes wouldn't survive Napoleon, but the crowning achievement, the meter, would conquer the world. Napoleon, who had a knack for far-reaching predictions, said of the expedition to secure the meter, quote, Conquests will come and go, but this work will endure. And so it has. Today, only three countries, the United States, Liberia, and Myanmar, do not employ the meter as their standard. It is the universal measurement of science, and is employed by 95% of the world's population. If the United States were ever to adopt it, that number would be 99%. The meter is now tied into the fabric of the universe. It is officially defined as the distance light travels in 1,299,000,000, 372,458th of a second, and always will be. If the speed of light is ever known more precisely, then it will be the length of the meter that will change. For all that, one thing that the meter certainly is not is one ten millionth the distance between Earth's equator and the North Pole. According to modern satellite measurements, that distance is, in fact, 10,2290 meters. That the meter might be in error was not unnoticed at the time. Indeed, one man would lose his life trying to correct it. The story of the attempt and ultimate failure to tie the meter down is one of the weirdest in the history of science, and it began more than a hundred years before the meter was conceived. Longtime viewers of my channel will be acquainted with Christian Hauchens, the talented Dutch astronomer who discovered Saturn's rings and its moon Titan. Another of his accomplishments that I briefly mentioned while outlining his life was that he was also the inventor of the pendulum clock. His experiments with pendulums led him to explore what we now call gravity, during which he showed that in lower gravity, pendulums would swing more slowly. However, since Hauchens predated Newton, he drew not on gravity, but on the earlier idea of vortices, according to which vacuum did not exist, and motion through space was defined by vortices of material that span in every region of the universe. Matter tends to collect on the outer rims of vortices, and the paths of objects through space were simply the paths through that forest of vortices. Vortices were conceived by the philosopher René Descartes. Most people, most watching this video anyway, have probably heard of René Descartes. His declaration of cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, is one of the most quoted and misunderstood philosophical statements in history. Descartes' intention in coining that phrase was to take philosophy back to first principles. Forget everything you've read, forget everything you've learned, when stripped of all experience, what do you know? You know that you exist. A baby newly born into this world with no ability to sense it would still be aware of its own existence. Your existence is the one thing you cannot argue away, the one thing about which you can be absolutely certain. You are aware, therefore you exist. You think, therefore you are. For a man seemingly so rooted to radical skepticism, Descartes was very quick to rationalize God into existence. His argument rests on the idea that everyone has an innate understanding of the existence of God, and since nothing can come from nothing, the idea of God must have some objective reality. Like all attempts to prove God's existence, this idea collapses if you think about it too intently, but it would nonetheless have surprising bearing on this story. In 1671, Jean Richer, an assistant to Giovanni Domenico Cassini, another Saturnian luminary and the director of the newly established French Academy of Sciences, was sent to French Guiana on a mission to map the southern skies. He carried with him two of the newfangled pendulum clocks, but despite being as delicately calibrated as possible for the time, the new contraptions refused to keep time, losing about two and a half minutes a day. Richer realized that this time loss was systematic, and solved the problem by shortening the pendulums by a twelfth of an inch, or 2.8 millimeters. Isaac Newton argued that Richer's inconvenience was evidence that Earth bulged outward at the equator, since, because gravity depends both on mass and on distance from the center of an object, 
The farther from the center of an object you are, the lower the gravity you experience, and thus, the more slowly a pendulum will swing. Newton concluded that this bulge was due to the centrifugal force caused by Earth's spin. He was right, but in science, you're not right until someone else proves you right. It's odd to think today, but in the first years following their publication in 1687, Isaac Newton's ideas were hugely controversial. It didn't help that almost no one could understand them. Today, they seem almost intuitive, but at the time they appeared as fantastical and incomprehensible as many today find general relativity or quantum mechanics. Given that few physicists of the time even possessed the necessary mathematical knowledge to grasp Newton's new physics, they instead chose to frame their argument as an ideological conflict. To them, Newton was the vanguard of the alien, atheist ideas of the Enlightenment, and perhaps worse, an attempt by the English to invade France's intellectual space in a kind of platonic Agincourt. As their academic Jean d'Arc, French opponents to Newton raised René Descartes, though since he'd been dead for over a decade by this point, we cannot know if he would have chosen the role himself. Descartes, unlike the supposedly godless followers of the Enlightenment, still allowed space for the divine in his philosophy. For devoutly Catholic France, that trumped any verified mathematical cloud talk the English could throw at them. Also, since Descartes didn't use math to back up his ideas, that made them more accessible to the general public. Newton's assertion that the world bulged at the equator became the totemic battle of this conflict, with Descartes and his vortices held up as the opposition. Descartes himself had never opined on the shape of the Earth, but subsequent mathematicians and philosophers had concluded that his vortex-dominated universe demanded that the Earth be elongated at the poles, like a lemon, rather than at the equator, like a tomato. The fight between the Cartesian lemon Earth and the Newtonian tomato Earth was practical as much as ideological. An accurate value for the shape of the Earth would aid in navigation, and thus with war. For the same reason, in 1714, the British launched the Longitude Prize for the first person to demonstrate a practical method for determining longitude at sea, which 170 years later would result in the establishment of Greenwich as the prime meridian. In 1734, jean frederic Philippot, Comte de Merepas, the Minister of the Navy, suggested a scientific expedition to the equator to determine the figure of the Earth. Such a trip would require traversing the equator by land, which was a problem, since land only crossed the equator in three places. Indonesia, which was too far away, Central Africa, which was unmapped, unknown, and disease-ridden, and the northern tip of South America. With the last option basically choosing itself, the French monarchy made all due overtures to the Spanish Empire, under whose dominion that region of the world still lay. The Spanish agreed, provided they could send members of their own military to oversee the expedition. The geodesic mission to the equator, as it became known, was the first international scientific expedition. The French team comprised mathematician Charles-Marie de la Condamine, naval scientist Pierre Bourrier, and astronomer Louis Godon, while the Spanish sent two naval geographers, Jorge Juan and Antonio Ulloa. In 1735, the team left Cadiz for what was then the Viceroyalty of New Granada, specifically the royal audience of Quito, now the capital of Ecuador. Their plan was to perform essentially a giant 300-kilometer chain of Socotoas, using the lengths between established high points, called stations, and the angles between them to determine the length of the meridian arc. This technique, called triangulation, would be used by every other attempt to calculate the figure of the Earth. They estimated that the project would take two years to complete. It took ten. The reasons for this are many and various. Going to the equator, the team had packed for the tropics, forgetting that the Andes are some of the tallest peaks in the world and, at the heights they would be working at, about as tropical as a British winter. Many would suffer from yellow fever and, once they arrived, a condition of which they had no prior knowledge, altitude sickness. They found themselves obstructed at every local level by incredulous officials and side-eyeing commoners none of whom could comprehend why anyone would go to such insane trouble to measure land, and assumed they must have been smugglers. This perception wasn't helped when the Comte de Merapas, who for some reason had invited himself on this trip, decided to sell merchandise to the Indians, 
And that highlights the real reason the expedition took as long as it did. The personalities of the people involved. Le Condamine was a man of undoubted genius, but questionable priorities. Whilst an enlisted man fighting in the War of the Quadruple Alliance, he had stood on deck during a sea battle wearing a bright purple coat, refusing to go below until ordered. Godon was an unrepentant lech whose appetite for prostitutes made a serious dent in the expedition's budget, including a diamond ring purchased for one of them for the equivalent of 27,000 modern dollars. By the time they arrived, the thankfully wealthy Le Condamine found himself out of pocket for all of their expenses. The mission surgeon, Jean Seignogue, was very likely bipolar or even schizophrenic, and when he challenged someone who owed him money to a duel, the situation spiraled so far out of control that the team were nearly torn apart by a lynch mob. Needless to say, this cadre of eclectic eccentrics did not get along, and by the time they reached the New World, they had already split up. Le Condamine, true to form, decided to strike out on his own into the uncharted jungle without a guide. Astoundingly, he survived, and even managed to record the first European observation of rubber tapping by the local Indians. He also, as directed by the Academy of Sciences, conducted scientific observations of the cinchona plant, the natural source of the anti-malarial drug quinine. Bouguer and Le Condamine eventually reconnected at the agreed spot and began to take measurements of 50 volcanic peaks. The work was tedious and backbreaking, conducted in miserable weather and with only grudging assistance from local porters. Bouguer complained that the natives of the region had no imagination and were incapable of creating anything new while simultaneously marveling at the wondrous stone ruins their Inca ancestors had constructed just 200 years earlier. Their Spanish colleagues, whom the Condamine insisted, much to their chagrin, on calling the Auxiliaries, were called away from the project and drafted into one of the stupidest wars in history, the War of Jenkins's Ear, in which a severing of a British slave trader's ear by a Spanish captain eight years earlier, a punishment for smuggling, which he very likely was, was conveniently cited as causus belli. But, after five years of tribulation, Le Condamine and Bouguer, they had largely ditched the useless Godon, completed their survey and, to their delight and undoubted relief, found that their results differed by just 0.02%. Sonkaski, the northernmost point of the arc, and Tarki, the southernmost point, were 2 degrees, 27 minutes, and 11 seconds apart, and were separated by about 250 kilometers. Mission accomplished. Except Godon complained that a variation in the position of one of the stars they had used as a guide meant that the entire enterprise had to be run again, which they did, thanks to faulty instruments, for another three years. Ironically, what Godon had noticed wasn't an error at all, but a then only just discovered phenomenon called the aberration of starlight, a shift in the apparent positions of stars produced by the motion of the Earth around the Sun. Le Condamine and Bouguer, never cordial, were at each other's throats by the end. Le Condamine refused to speak to Bouguer after he claimed to see a mistake in his calculations and spent most of the remaining budget building monuments to their achievement in the jungle. After Bouguer and Le Condamine returned to Paris, they spent much of their time sniping each other in the press over who deserved more credit and fame for their mutual exploit. Given that you likely have never heard of either of them, that was a sad waste of energy. Someone better known today was the Swedish astronomer and physicist Anders Celsius, inventor of the temperature scale that bears his name. Celsius was part of the second Great Triangulation Expedition, this one to the Arctic Circle. Such was the insanity of the equatorial expedition that its Arctic counterpart was conceived, planned, and executed a year after it began, and completed years before it ended. Upon hearing of the discord within that expedition, Celsius commented that, quote, their dissensions mean they won't get anything done. I just hope one of them doesn't get his throat cut. He was luckier than he knew that his hope was borne out. The joint Swedish-French expedition was headed by Pierre-Louis Moreau de Montpatouy, an accomplished soldier, scientist, and scion of a family of French privateers. Montpatouy was a supporter of Isaac Newton. He was a friend of the philosopher Voltaire, who had done much to popularize Newton in France, and found himself a target of Jacques Cassini, the son of Giovanni Domenico Cassini, and, like him, director of the Paris Observatory. Cassini had done his own triangulation work outside Paris, and from it concluded that the Earth was prolate, or lemon-shaped. His defense of his conclusions went beyond academic ego. 
Cassini was supported by the Jesuits and so held up the divine order of Descartes over the godless wilderness of Newton. To settle the matter, in 1736, Maupertuis, Celsius, and four colleagues set out for the Gulf of Bothnia, the elbow crook at the top of Scandinavia, to measure the length of a degree near the pole. The team had one major advantage over their hapless colleagues in Quito. The Swedish government was positively giddy to help them achieve their goal and provided them with a team of Finnish porters. Finland and Sweden were united in one monarchy at the time, and even a small squad of soldiers who felled trees to secure lines of sight. In many other ways, however, the Arctic expedition was as ill-conceived as its South American sibling. The French team had little experience working in the cold, succumbing to frostbite and dehydration, and often sloshed on hard spirits because they were the only drink that wouldn't freeze. The team had set up a base at the town of Tornia, now Tornio, where the local Sami people treated them like royalty. The team were only too happy to return the favor, and filled the local girls' hearts with dreams of Paris as they sought comfort on long winter nights. As for their porters, well, it was easy to ignore them, since no one on the team spoke Finnish. The question of how exactly they would conduct their measurement was resolved relatively quickly. Celsius had suggested just waiting for winter and then conducting the entire survey on the ice in the frozen gulf. A suggestion met with stony silence. Rather, it was decided that the valley of the Torna River, which flows into the Gulf of Bothnia, would be the line to follow. Using the spire at the Church of Tornia as the first station, the team would construct nine geodetic points, measuring multiple angles from multiple positions, so the results could be checked against one another. While the journey was arduous and involved constructing towers of wood in the driving snow, it took only two years. If you're thinking of sighing with relief at this point, however, don't. This expedition saved its madness for the return. In 1737, the team returned to Paris and announced to the world that the length of a degree at the Gulf of Bothnia was, in modern terms, about 691 meters longer than a degree in France, and thus that Newton was, in fact, right. The world is flattened at the pole. Jacques Cassini reacted like water hitting cesium. He decried their results as false and demanded that every fact and event of their expedition be set down to be checked and vetted. The team did so though one of the members, Alexis Claude Clairot, complained that, quote, although one could hardly believe that six astronomers and mathematicians would be incapable of tracing the meridian, placing an instrument in the right position, and calculating to the right precision, here are the measures we took for this operation. Such a simple one, by the way, that the details have never been demanded of anyone before. Cassini blasted the team's use of the Graham sector. Uh, <gasps> British instrument that of course would comply with Newton's satanic mechanics. Celsius fired back with attacks on Cassini, his father, his observatory, and French instruments. On top of this, during the Ferrari, a young Sami woman and her sister appeared at the door of Clairo's secretary, complaining that he had bedded her and promised to marry her, and that she had come to see the promise fulfilled. The secretary was a bit put out by this, but Mapartui eventually resolved the situation by sending one of the sisters to a nunnery and marrying the other off to an abusive, impoverished nobleman who ran off with her dowry. The issue of the Earth's shape was only resolved to everyone's satisfaction in 1745, when the expedition to Quito finally returned and provided results that matched those of the Arctic team. The flattening of the Earth was about one part in 310, that is to say, the Earth's polar diameter is 1 310th shorter than its equatorial diameter. This is only slightly smaller than its modern value, which is closer to one part in 298. In 1758, the calculated return of Comet Halley set Newton's laws into the firmament for good, or at least until Einstein overturned them 150 years later. Oddly, when Arthur Eddington provided the first experimental proof of Einstein's universe to the Royal Society, Many stood up and walked out, because Einstein's chaotic relativism spat in the face of Newton's godly cosmic order. Spitting in the face of cosmic order was definitely on the minds of those who instigated the French Revolution half a century later. By 1794, most of France's 40,000 churches were closed, destroyed, or defiled. Graves were dug up, their occupants re judged in accordance to their value to the Republic. 
Priests were forced to renounce their ordinations, flee, or face execution. Crosses were toppled and replaced with emblems of a deistic supreme being or to the cult of reason. The revolution was nothing less than an attempt to remake the world, and to remake the world, you must first remeasure it. To be fair, there was an immense practical need to establish a unified measuring system. Historians estimate that pre-revolutionary France employed up to a quarter of a million different weights and measures, under 800 different names. This rendered maps unreliable, hindered efficient taxation, and hobbled domestic trade. Rather than distance, land was often calculated in terms of productivity, six bushels of grain versus five, or in terms of how many men could till or pick it in a day. This assumed a standard productivity per person, a standard to which peasants could demand their pay be set, rather than how productive they actually were. Because so many local weights used the same names, a baker could sell one weight of loaf when grain prices were low, and another smaller weight when prices were higher, and thus not precipitate a bread riot. Monks could circumvent prohibitions against earning profit by fermenting wine in barrels of one size and selling it at cost in smaller barrels. The project to calculate the meter was spearheaded in 1790 by the French Academy of Sciences, led by its secretary, the Marquis de Condorcet, a mathematician and fervent Democrat who had attempted to apply probability theory to the outcomes of votes and elections. Condorcet declared the mission, quote, for all people, for all time. This final triangulation slog would follow the Paris meridian for 10 degrees of latitude, from Dunkirk in the north to Barcelona in the south and cross 45 degrees north, the midpoint between the equator and the pole. Two men would be chosen to make the trek, one going north, the other south. They would each set out from Paris, make their way to the end, and then double back and retrace their steps. The southern leg was shorter than the northern, but involved crossing the Pyrenees and entering into foreign territory. Initially, the great nations of the Enlightenment, France, Britain, and the United States, were united in common purpose of a unified system of measurement. But the moment that Thomas Jefferson learnt that the French would be employing the Paris Meridian as their base unit, he withdrew the U.S. from the project, a schism that remains to this day. The project's greatest flaw, however, was that it was conceived by a nation on fire. Condorcet, despite his ardent belief in the revolution and the promotion of Enlightenment ideals, found his moderate views increasingly at odds with the bloodlust around him and soon faced the guillotine. <laughs> the same would be true of Antoine Lavoisier, the Academy's treasurer and an ardent backer of the mission, who, despite being one of the greatest scientific minds in history, he is single-handedly responsible for the systematized chemical names, such as sulfur dioxide or copper sulfate, we use every day, had the misfortune of also being a very rich tax collector. <laughs> it took only a moment to cut off his head, said mathematician Joseph Louis Lagrange, and a hundred years may not give us another like it. This was not the ideal climate to engage a cross-country march in the name of scientific truth, but the two men chosen, Jean-Baptiste Joseph de Lombre, who went north, and Pierre-François-André Machon, who went south, could not have pursued it more zealously. And that is not an exaggeration. They literally could not have. Delambre actually has a small cameo in one of my earlier videos, having been one of the theoretical astronomers who wrestled with the wild orbit of Uranus. A child prodigy, he had just about the worst start in life imaginable for a prospective astronomer, when an attack of smallpox as a toddler left him virtually blind. While his eyesight would improve, he set himself on a purely lettered education, and even entertained thoughts of entering the church, but found himself forced to learn mathematics when he became the tutor to the son of a rich Ancien Regime family. He apparently made quite an impression, as they built him an observatory on their roof. But their support was already wobbling, as the revolution had swept away their aristocratic rents. Eventually he fell under the wing of Jérôme Lelande, the great astronomer today best known for almost discovering Neptune, who encouraged him to become an astronomer. Ten years later, de Lombre was one of the best in the country. Méchon was an expert surveyor with a reputation for insanely obsessive exactitude. Also an astronomer, his keen eye had found eleven comets. Like de Lombre, he was forced to take on a tutoring position to make ends meet, and, according to legend, was even forced to sell his astronomical instruments to cover his father's debts over a lost lawsuit. 
only to see that misfortune flip when those instruments were purchased by Jérôme Lalande, who took him on as a protégé. Delambre stated flatly that this story was likely made up, but it is stuck as an illustration of Méchant's fervent, self-destructive sense of honor. In June 1792, each equipped with customized carriages, the most advanced instruments, and skilled assistants, the two knights errant set out on their quest for the honor of science. It was a quest they would not complete for seven years. Though they weren't to know it, their timing could not have been worse, as history was on a knife edge, and they were about to fall off. When they left, despite the foment of the revolution, France was still technically a constitutional monarchy. Three months later, King Louis XVI, the man with whose authority all of their writs had been stamped, was arrested. To begin his survey, Delambre attempted to establish a Paris station. Unfortunately, he soon realized that lighting the required signal flares while the city was in a state of civil war had made him a target. Unable to establish the hill of Montmartre as his first station, he instead attempted the ruined tower of Montjay, but the carpenter he'd hired to construct the observation platform was assaulted by a peasant mob who believed him in league with the demon legions of the evil priest whose ghost still haunted the place. In September, when Louis was a month in prison, de Lambre reached the Chateau de Bellassise, or Beautiful Seat, a perfect locale for a station. Unfortunately, the locals did not take kindly to his arriving on a king's errand and arrested him. This was not a good time to be arrested. The reign of terror had just begun, and half the prison population of Paris had been massacred days before. No sooner had de Lambre managed to talk his way out of jail than he was stopped again, the gendarmes demanding to know why his carriage was full of spying equipment. Mindful of his life, de Lambre gave what could very well be the most high-stakes science seminar in history, outlining in concise, exhaustive detail to the restive mob exactly what he was attempting to do. It didn't work. The rabble overturned his boxes and found a royal seal, obviously a traitorous attempt to carry messages from the imprisoned king. To appease the crowd, de Lambre read every word of his royal order, and then a second, and then a third, all of which were identical. Realizing that breaking the seal rendered his writs void, de Lambre offered to give up his life if a final letter chosen at random was not also identical. It was. Feigning anger, a local administrator dragged de Lambre back into the town hall and forced him to stay the night, very likely saving him from death, until the authority could be transferred from the king to the republic. Michon was also arrested by revolutionaries, though his experience was not as precarious as de Lambre's had been. He nonetheless set out under a cloud, and would have done so regardless, as he suffered from chronic depression and paranoia. Even so, he had more reason than many to fear the revolution. Michon and his wife made their home at the Paris Observatory, and the then current director, Dominique Cassini, fourth of his line to hold the directorship, and thus known simply as Cassini Cat, was under suspicion for royalist sympathies. Shortly after the storming of the Bastille three years earlier, a mob had rushed the observatory grounds, terrifying his wife as they ransacked the buildings for anything of value to the cause. Cassini led the rabble through various cellars, and, seeing as there was little of strategic value, they left. That would not save Cassini, however, as before the geodetic mission was completed, his royalism would see him thrown in prison, and very nearly executed. To ensure that his family had some form of income while he was serving the nation, Michon had handed his position at the observatory to his wife, who had been his assistant for years, and was already a competent astronomer in her own right. Should a similar crisis happen again, there would be nothing he could do to save her. One thing that proved surprisingly easy, initially at least, was diplomacy with Spain. Despite mistrusting the revolution and all it stood for, the Spanish Empire was interested in the state-of-the-art technology used for the expedition, in particular the repeating circle, a surveying telescope with an accuracy of one arc second, or finer than a human hair. But by the time Michon had crossed the Pyrenees into Spain, the revolution had worn out its welcome. The execution of Louis XVI in January 1793 had transformed the revolution in the eyes of Europe's monarchs from a local affair into a personal mortal threat. By March, every major power on the continent was at war with France. Spain, 
France's ancient ally, was the last to declare. This left Michon in an unenviable position. Obviously, he couldn't leave. His survey of the Pyrenees was of incalculable military value to the French. On the other hand, it was also of incalculable military value to the Spanish, since they, astoundingly, had never surveyed Catalonia themselves. Fate was to resolve Michon's crisis of conscience in the most horrific way imaginable. An accident while examining a water pump crushed nearly every bone in Michon's body, leaving him hovering near death for several months. Until then, Michon had no concern but pain. Delambre, on the other hand, flew through the remainder of his work. No longer encumbered with royalist decrees, he accomplished more in a month than he had in the previous year. His fast pace allowed him to outrun the tide of war, but it would not be the conflict that undid him. The forces at play in the New Republic had long seen the Academy of Sciences as a cadre of self-appointed elitist and a vestige of the old regime. Jean-Paul Marat called the Academy cowardly lackeys of despotism and declared the 300,000 livres set aside for the geodetic mission, quote, a little cake they will share out among confederates. In August 1793, the Academy was dissolved, and Delambre was removed from the project for, quote, lacking revolutionary zeal. Thankfully, he was allowed to finish off his measurements in such a way so as to not have to redo all his calculations. Meanwhile, the stranded Machon, having partially recovered from his injury, was contemplating taking a job offer from the King of Spain, even though such an act would have been treason. Such was the trust that the Spanish crown placed in him, that they even allowed him to continue with his survey once he had regained full use of his arm essentially allowing an agent of a hostile power to surveil their frontiers in time of war. Naturally, he was not allowed to hand his results to the French, though his assistant did, since not to do so would technically also have been treason. Merchant and his assistant, Tranchot, would often find themselves surveying from the tops of hills while battles raged in the valleys below. It was here that Merchant met his nemesis. Calculating the latitude of his station on Mont Rui required the accurate mapping of six separate stars. Five were determined to within 0.3 arc second, but the sixth, Mizar, was off by a full four arc second. Michon pondered how this could be. Such an error was beyond his comprehension. How could he, of all people, have blundered so badly? He pondered if it might be due to refraction. Mizar was closer to the horizon in Catalonia than it was further north where the first results were taken. This affront to nature had to be cleansed. From December 1793 to March 1794, Méchant took 10,000 separate observations. But when he attempted to check his results, he found an error beyond any he had seen in his life. His results disagreed by a full 5.4%. For the meticulous Méchant, this horrific revelation must have had more impact than the water pump. Cut off by war and a testy Spanish crown, Michon had no way to retake his observations. He would never do so again. By 1795, things were looking up for Delambre and Michon. The Academy of Sciences was reinstated, though with Lalande in charge. Cassini was understandably weary of his career as a lightning rod for revolutionary spite, and retired to his chateau, never to conduct science again. That June, the new head of cartography, Etienne Calon, recommenced the metric mission and sought Delambre for the job, assuming he must have been in prison. He was not, as he had wisely kept his head down during the terror and was able not only to claim a salary for the first time, but also back pay. That was not enough, however. The French government had made that eternal blunder of all unstable regimes, printing money to cover its debts. As you might predict, this sent prices spiraling outside the capital. A horse that could be hired for 92 francs in Paris cost 1,400 francs by the time Delambre reached the coast. On top of that, Delambre's pay was in a new revolutionary currency that no one outside Paris would touch with a 10-foot stick. With Delambre learning to get by on less, his second go-round took on the tone of a boy's own adventure. He slept in haylofts and subsisted on cheese, often fleeing wrathful locals who assumed he must have been a sorcerer. After all, why else would anyone have wooden pyramids constructed on mountain tops? Outwardly, Méchant was in a better position than Delambre. With his old friend Lalande in charge of the observatory, 
His family were moved into Cassini's old apartments. He eventually made his way to neutral Italy, where he was finally able to hear from his wife. But in his mind, Michon was in hell. In modern terms, Michon was very likely bipolar, and saw his mistake as a crime against men and gods for which he could never be forgiven. Paranoia that others might learn of his monstrous error stalked his every waking hour, and he never mentioned it directly in conversation. Realizing that Michon's self-flagellation could derail the entire project, Delambre beseeched him to please return to Paris with his survey results, making grand claims of his genius to rebuild his shattered ego. In reply, Michon wrote, quote, I will make every sacrifice, renounce everything, rather than return to Paris without having completed my portion of the labor. And if I am not allowed to complete it, I will never return. Either I shall recover strength and energy I should never have lost, or I shall cease to exist. To Delambre, that line read a lot like a suicide note. With Michon's wife about to visit her husband for the first time in six years, he pleaded with her to get him to hand over his data. Michon's response to his wife's request was to dissemble and obfuscate, lying to her for the first time in his life. But then, in February 1799, a miracle. Delambre submitted his data to the International Commission of Weights and Measures, and a month later, Michon followed suit. The reception was ecstatic, with some claiming Michon's measurements were better than Delambre. Michon's attitude changed overnight. But there was a problem. Decimalization is hard. Certainly, the War Office had no interest in recalibrating all its cannonball manufacturing machines for the new standard. Even Napoleon who had initially praised the meter, found himself siding with the peasants, angry at having their world upturned. Quote, it was not enough for them to make 40 million people happy. They wanted to sign up the whole universe. Eventually, in 1800, Boney compromised. The metric system would be adopted, but the frightening Greek prefixes would be replaced with homier alternatives. The decimeter became the palm, the centimeter, the digit, and the millimeter, the trait, or trace. Even so, the meter wasn't officially adopted in France until 1840, when it had already been adopted by several other European countries. Méchon eventually joined his wife and children at the Paris Observatory, replacing Cassini as director, and, to wash away his sin, focused obsessively on administrative reform. Meanwhile, Napoleon had appointed himself head of the National Academy of Sciences, and Delambre its permanent secretary. Delambre was also temporarily appointed to president of the Bureau of Longitudes, making him Michon's de facto superior. Soon, as per usual in this story, he and Michon were bickering about lack of funds and, yes, even stolen credit. Michon accused Delambre of using his triangulation data without his permission. By the turn of the 19th century, Michon was basking in the glow of success. He was finally established at the observatory and earning a stellar reputation. He had time for his wife and his children. He had no reason whatsoever to do what he was about to do. The International Commission of Weights and Measures had declared the geodetic ordeal over. The meter was set, literally, in stone, in walls, buildings, and corners in 16 high-visibility locations around Paris, and also embodied in a platinum bar sealed in the National Archive. For Michon to contemplate returning to Spain to finish his triangulations must have seemed like lunacy, and perhaps it was. The previous trip had involved lugging heavy equipment up single trackways by mule, and Michon was still fragile from his accident. There was a very strong chance he would not return from the mission alive. But Michon would not be dissuaded, and in April of 1803, set out to Spain to extend the Meridian Arc farther south, specifically to the islands of Ibiza and Mallorca. This was not as appealing a destination as it might appear. Today known for its beach houses and British retirees, the south coast of Spain was better known then as a sultry, seething pit of fever. Michon's mission augured ill from the start. The Spanish were singularly unhelpful. The head of the Madrid Observatory, a Catholic priest, hated France, the revolution, and the metric system, declaring it a fantastical lie to pervert Spanish virtue. When the Spanish told Michon that it was possible to see the mainland from Mallorca, he probably should have concluded they were lying. Michon's biggest problem, though, was his inability to delegate. He insisted on taking all measures himself, even if it meant trekking to the most inaccessible locations. At one point, 
he managed to crack his skull again after falling off his mule. When he discovered that the Spanish had in fact lied to him about the visibility from Mallorca, his response was defiantly and hilariously French. I thumb my nose at them! Yes, he really said that. Michon had had a daredevil's luck, evading death on several occasions, but there was one misfortune he could not avoid. By September 1803, he was invalided again, delirious with yellow fever and malaria, and it was that illness that finally took his life. He never returned home. Despite their mild squabbles, de Lambert took it upon himself to ensure Michon's place in history. He delivered his eulogy to the Academy of Sciences and set about composing the definitive account of their laborious odyssey. But upon receiving all of Machan's notes, de Lambert realized that the man's paroxysms of self-loathing had been a mask for deception. Machan hadn't simply made an error. He had engaged in a long-running attempt to hide it. He had merged ill-fitting triangulations into larger ones, or simply discarded results that didn't fit with prior measurements. He had even doctored his measurement of the Paris Observatory's latitude to be closer to de Lambert's, even though modern measurements show that his was closer. De Lambert's final publication made note of Michon's discrepancy, he refused to call it an error, but omitted any mention of his duplicity, discreetly buried in the observatory's archive. De Lambre eventually concluded that the totality of Michon's data suggested the true length of the meter was somewhat an error, and that its true value differed by about 0.01%. Subsequent studies of Michon's data suggest that the true culprit may have been the gradual wear of his repeating circle as he obsessively checked and rechecked his results. Once later researchers recalibrated his results to account for that, they matched to an almost supernatural degree. Although, according to author Ken Alder, the real problem was simply that true accuracy is impossible, and the idea that scientific results can be perfect is a fallacy. The meter is as accurate as you would expect it to be, given the technology and mathematical understanding of the time it was made. And in the end, it doesn't really matter. Today, hardly anyone knows that the meter is meant to be one ten millionth of a quarter of the Earth's meridian. If they notice that the circumference of the Earth is surprisingly close to 40,000 kilometers, their most likely response would be to nod and move on. A meter is like any other form of measurement, from the foot, to the cubit, to the talent. It doesn't matter if it's accurate. It matters that it is consistent. And that's the Earth sorted. Mostly. But once you step outside the Earth, you'll find that 10,000 is far less at home. And that's what we'll be seeing in the next episode. I hope you all enjoy this first of a two-part series, exploring the number 10,000 for my 10,000 subscriber video. It is much longer than I originally anticipated, but that is what happens when you have two and a half months to spare for researching. I'd like to point you to my new website, link in the description, and I'd like to profoundly thank Tim Shipper of Aranya Development for setting it up for me. The script for the next video is already written, so you should be seeing it in a week or so. Thanks again, fellow seekers, and remember to stay curious.